Hi there, my name is Vic Veer. I'm the head of the ENT Sleep Centre Department at the Royal National ENT Hospital in Central London. And I'm going to continue my little video series about hypoglossal nerve implants and how they help people with obstructive sleep apnea. I've already done a video on the Inspire device, and I've just done a video on the Genio Nixwo um, device. Now, what I want to do in this video is to compare and contrast the two together. So just work out the differences between them. I think it's important to do a head-to-head -head between them because there are going to be situations out there where you know, a lot of the time the surgeon will go, look, you, you really need this one, the other one won't work for you, or the other way around. But in several cases, the surgeon might turn around to you and say, look, you know something? Both of these would work for you really well. Which one do you like the sound of? And you sort of face with this big decision, which one should I have implanted in me for the rest of my life? So it's important to understand what the pros and cons are for each. So to start with, I'm going to just do a quick recap about what each of these implants do. This Inspire implant is implanted. So it's put underneath the skin and fat, sits on top of your pec muscle or pectoralis muscle just about here. And then there's two wires coming out of it. One wire goes to the lungs, tells you when, uh, tells the machine or the computer inside here when you're breathing. And then it relays that information up a wire that goes to your hypoglossal nerve. The hypoglossal nerve brings the tongue forward if you get it at the right spot. So when you take a deep breath during sleep, then the tongue is uh, asked to move forward out of the way. So instead of the tongue falling back and blocking your breathing, what happens is that the, the implant encourages your tongue to move forward so you can breathe behind it and everything works fine. Now, the Genio implant is slightly different. It's actually like a chip that sits underneath your chin. And what it does is implant it underneath your skin again, underneath your muscle, and sits right on top of the nerve. So it's both nerves, actually, that come along here and go up into your tongue like that. So I think immediately you can see that these two devices are very, very different. You've got the Inspire device, which is a battery that simulates one nerve. And you've got the Genio device that sits on both of the ends of these nerves and simulates both nerves at the same time. So it is interesting that they, although they both work really well on people with a tongue-based problem, so that means that the tongue falls back and blocks your breathing at night, they both work subtly differently. So for example, with the Inspire device, this wire comes up around here and twizzles around the nerve, but it also goes around the C1 nerve. And the C1 nerve does something slightly different to the, the main hypoglossal nerve. The main hypoglossal nerve just protrudes your tongue and brings your tongue forward, but the C1 nerve also rotates your, um, your voice box. So I'll try and explain that. So the hypoglossal nerve if you've got the teeth here and the tongue coming down like this, both um, implants will push this forward out of the way so you can breathe down the airway like that. Now, the Inspire device does that through the hypoglossal nerve, and it also twizzles around the C1 nerve. And what, the, what happens to the voice box is it rotates like this. Instead of it getting blocked that way, and sometimes people have what's called an epiglottic trapdoor problem, and I'll try and explain that. So you've got the tongue coming down like this. You've got the teeth there, tongue coming down like this. And at the bottom, you've got your airway, the, the windpipe going down into your lungs. And on top of that, there's this little vocal cords that open and close like this. Now, to stop all the food and water you eat coming down here and going into your lungs and making you choke every time you eat, there's a, there's a bit of cartilage that sticks up like this. So when food and water comes down the tongue, it hits this and goes around the voice box and stops it from all pouring into your, into your lungs. So this epiglottis, which is like a bit of cartilage in your ear, sometimes in people with obstructive sleep apnea, because the voice box is pushed that way, it can fall back and block off the breathing. Now, that's not great. The people who have CPAP can't breathe at all with it because this thing just gets flapped down and blocks off their breathing. It's quite rare, but it does happen quite a lot of the time. Stimulating the C1 nerve seems to rotate the larynx slightly forward. So the tongue's moving forward like this, and this rotates that way and opens up the airway. Now, Inspire have asked me not to talk about this because they don't really have the evidence for it yet. And that I uh, commendable because actually um, I've got the evidence. I just haven't published it yet. And finally, for a long time, I'm allowed to talk about the other implant, which I haven't mentioned in any of my videos properly yet but I'll do that in another video. But back to Inspire. So the, the epiglottis 
the voice box, everything rotates slightly this way. So it just opens up your airway better so you can breathe a bit better. It works really well on those people with a, I think, a, a laryngeal problem as well as a tongue problem. Whereas the Genio device works very differently. It sits on both nerves and it also brings the tongue forward. It doesn't really collect the C1 nerves on both sides. But what it does do, it seems to also benefit the lateral wall. Now I'll try and explain that now. So you've got the teeth coming towards you this time and the tongue coming down like that. You'll have the tonsils here, left and right here and the dangly thing, the uvula and the soft palate up there. Now, if you look, think about behind the tonsils and the uvula, this back wall here that you'd see behind this uvula, sometimes that wall there collapses in like this. When I say sometimes, you know, roughly sort of 50% of the time, that's a problem. And so you're almost always either a lateral wall problem or a tongue problem. Now, if you're a tongue problem, it's a no-brainer. Both of these would work for it. For some reason, this genio implant, which sits on both nerves, seems to pull the tongue forward symmetrically rather than the Inspire, which slightly turns to one side the tongue. It symmetrically pulls it forward and seems to pull on that lateral wall to stop it from falling in so much. Now, this is preliminary data, and um, a lot of it hasn't been published yet, but the data looks really good, and I'll talk more about it in my podcast when I eventually release it. But if you can get a device that helps people with lateral wall, that's 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 quite amazing because, as I said, I, I didn't believe it at the start, but it's great. This is good enough in terms of research that now the Genio device no longer requires a drug-induced sleep endoscopy for it to be used. Actually, our device also helps lateral wall problems as well as tongue problems, so we don't really need a drug-induced sleep endoscopy. Uh, so it's sort of open to almost everyone, as long as they meet the other criteria, which I've talked about in other videos. So going back to the differences between these two, the Genio implant, the one that goes underneath your chin, has one five centimeter incision just underneath there. And it's quite well hidden underneath uh, your neck uh, creases and things like that. The Inspire one is also not bad. There's one incision here and another incision just up there. So you do need two incisions. And I think that's important because with the Inspire implant, what it is, is they've got this chest lead that comes out and monitors when you're breathing. And so when you start breathing, that sets off the tongue muscle. So the Inspire implant synchronizes with your breathing. So when you take a breath, it protrudes your tongue forward. The Genio implant doesn't really do that. It's got no connection to your lungs or, or knows when you're really breathing. And so what it does is, it, it has no idea when you're breathing, so it sets your uh, when it opens and closes. So in a way, um, you're synchronizing with the implant, with the Genio, and it's the other way around. The Inspire synchronizes with your breathing. So, I mean, you can change the speed of breathing and things like that with the Genio. And actually, in the end, it doesn't seem to make that big a difference to people. The tolerance level for these is the same for, uh, for patients. So there's no real difference there. But it's a difference that some people might want to know. Two incisions synchronized with your breathing or not. And I said before that the Inspire device has a little lead that goes to the surface of your lung. And that's really important so it knows when you're breathing. But they're hoping to replace that with a gyrometer. So like with your phone, it wants to work out when you're breathing. So rather than having that lead. And it's important for one reason purely because putting that lead near your lung may accidentally damage the lung and cause it to deflate. I mean, I'm talking really, really low risk and less than 1% chance of causing what we call a pneumothorax. And we look out for it and we check for it and things like that. So the risk is very low, but it's something that they're trying to deal with because they don't want even that tiny risk either. So if they can have a gyrometer that, that knows when you're moving and knows when you're breathing without needing the lead, that makes that side of the operation a little bit safer. With the Inspire implant sitting just there, there is another problem of having a wire that goes all the way up like this. And one is that uh, you need to keep stretching your neck after the operation to stop it from snagging along the way so it keeps moving. If you don't do this a lot, you may accidentally cause a sort of a web appearance here. So you need to keep stretching it for the first few weeks until it's sort of no longer scar tissue there because you can get what's called a web there. As long as you do your neck rolls and things like that, that won't happen. Theoretically also, with this wire going over the collarbone just there, 
this is a hard object and it can get broken. So you could fall over and, and break your collarbone, for example. And it could be that your wire gets stuck in the collarbone or gets damaged. It's just easier to damage something which has got a long sort of distance between the battery and the wire. It can't be helped because you need the chest implant so you can um, you can synchronize with breathing and, and you need a, a battery somewhere. You can't have this battery sitting underneath your chin. So that's why it's there. But there is a chance because of that distance, you may damage it. Whereas with this chip that's quite soft that goes underneath your chin, it, I think there's a slightly less chance of damaging it, but again, I, you know, I'm, again, I'm talking very tiny little differences between the two. Another consideration of having a battery sitting on top of your pectoris muscle is that some people out there might have an awful lot of muscle on them, but not very much fat. And you know, a lot of these muscle-bound people uh, have too great a BMI, so they're not allowed this implant anyway. But if you were someone with very little fat, you might, like normal pacemakers, you might see the pacemaker sitting here. You might feel the battery here. And there is a sort of wire across here. You might feel it across the wire. You can feel what's going on all the way up here. But most people, you know, with a normal BMI or normal amounts of fat in their body won't be able to feel this or even see it afterwards. But some people might worry about that if they have very little fat on their body. Now, although there are some theoretical issues about having a battery here and a wire going up here and things like that, there are some big advantages. The first is that when this is implanted and your scars all healed up and everything, there's very little outside of you to show that you have a problem with obstructive sleep apnea. So it's it's quite discreet. You don't really know this is a problem. Whereas with the Genio device, you've got this thing implanted on your skin, so you don't actually ever see this again. But what you do have every night, you have to stick a sticker on and put the battery on underneath. I'll show you a picture of it for what it looks like. And so that's something that people will see. And some people might think, oh, that's a minor thing. I, I don't mind about that at all. It's better than CPAP. But some people really want it to be completely discreet, not know that there's anything in there at all. And so this sort of completely keeps you like what looks like a normal person afterwards. Now, you do have to turn on both of these devices. You turn on this device with, with a battery, and you also have an app to fix with the Genio device. But with the Inspire device, which is sitting in the chest like this, you use a remote control and you just turn it on each night. I think in America, they have an app as well on their phones. So you can turn it on that way. But at the moment, we, we've got the remote control. So you can see there's that big difference. You've got this battery that sits there for 10 years and needs to be replaced once every 10 years. Whereas this battery, um, sorry, I'll put it on. This battery for the Genius sits like that and you have to replace that basically every day. You take this sticker, put it on, you wear it at night. And once you finish it, you have to peel it off so it's got glue on it, so you might become slightly allergic to the glue. They've tried to use hypoallergenic glue and things like that, but there is a risk that um, people can get uh, allergies to, uh, to glue and things like that. So if you've got an allergy to glue, this is probably not the best thing for you. Um, but if you're okay with glue, you have to also remember that you can't really sport a beard at the same time because it doesn't really can't really get stuck onto hair because it needs to have a really close attachment to the area that you're trying to stimulate. So you have to shave every day if, if you're a man who can grow a big beard. So this won't work unless you shave. I mean, you can have a beard that sort of comes around the front like this and you can put it underneath and sort of hide it like that. But on the whole, you need to shave your beard. Now, both of these devices, the Inspire and the Genio, both have metal in them. You can imagine there has to be some metal in them because they're circuitry. The Inspire has more metal in it. And like I said, it, it feels a bit like a pacemaker. And so the only worry about that is that if you need an MRI scanner later on, then MRI scanners don't really like metal in the body because, because it works on magnets. And if you have a powerful enough magnet, you're not allowed to have an MRI scan with too much metal inside you. Now, the good news is that the Inspire device can have a 1.5 Tesla MRI, whereas with the Genius device, because it's got less metal in it and less wires and things, you're allowed up to a three Tesla MRI. Now, if you may not know what that means, basically a three Tesla is more magnetism, uh, so higher resolution. So what I did was some digging to find out if this was really important or not. Is the 1.5 much worse than three? And there's not much difference in it. A three Tesla MRI scan is higher resolution because it's got greater magnets and things like that. 
And if you look at the, the rates in this country, it seems that in 2020, 17% of MRI scanners were three Tesla MRI scanners. So if you had one of these, you wouldn't be able to use one of those MRI scanners, the 17%. The rest you could, just not that 17%. And you think, well, that's all right. I could probably find another one. The only other thing I did find is in 2017, it showed that of the new scanners that were being built, 30% or 33% of them were three Teslas. It looks like more and more people are slowly moving towards three Tesla versus a 1.5 Tesla. So, I mean, the the life of an MRI scanner is over 10 years or so. So I think we're safe at the moment. There's plenty of 1.5 Tesla um, MRIs around. But it's if you're going to have lots and lots of uh, scans in the future, and it's in this area here, then probably not a great idea to have an Inspire. Knowing that you need lots of MRI scans might be better to have one of the other operations where you don't need an implant. So it's something to think about. And although it's not a massive consideration, it is a bit annoying that if you walk into an airport and you go beep every time you go through the scanner, it could happen with either of these. I guess that, again, there's less metal in this, so you're less likely to go beep. But I think if you were to go to any airport with an implant and they can scan you with one of those things that you have to step on the footprints or whatever it is, they may see something inside you and you probably want to take a sort of, I've got a medical implant card with you. So they know that, you know, it's not something dangerous for the aeroplane. Now, another thing I want to talk about is that with the Inspire implant, it goes up with the wire and goes around the nerve. So it encircles the nerve and tries to only stimulate that nerve. Whereas with the Genio implant, it has these paddles that sit on top of the nerve. So if a nerve is coming like this, this sits on top of it like that. So it captures all these little branches that go into the tongue. Now that's great. It works very well in both cases. But my worry is that, is there perhaps these little paddles are stimulating not just the nerves, but also maybe a little bit of the muscle around it. Is there a chance that actually, when we get a lot more data come through, that perhaps this causes a little bit more stimulation than you would really want? Now, as I said before, the tolerability from these two implants are very the same. People don't say, oh, this is really hurting, and you can change the stimulation, things like that. But there is that worry I have in my mind that this might be stimulating bits of muscle and things like that. The other thing to think about also is that if we had to remove one of these implants, which can happen if they get infected or something like that, it is a lot safer to remove the genome implant because we just undo the stitches here and then remove it because it's sitting on top of the nerve. It's not circled around it like the Inspire one. The Inspire one is pulled around, so you have to tease it out and hopefully you can put it out without damaging the nerve. So there's a slight, you know, it's so rare having to remove one of these implants, but that's something I think we should consider. And I think a really important thing to say is that the evidence available for the Inspire implant is huge. It's been around for over 10 years. Um, 90,000 have been done around the world, mostly in America. And so we've got an awful lot of information about what can happen with these implants, what the risks are, what issues there are with this implant. On the other hand, this is much new. It's only just really been released around the world. And so we don't have anywhere near as many of these done. I think we're coming up to about a thousand of these implants done around the world. And so we don't know what all the little things that could go wrong with this. It seems like, you know, as I said before, the efficacy, how well they work is about the same. The tolerability is about the same. And, you know, depending on what people like, what people don't like, the compliance is about the same as well. So it, it works just about the same on different people. But as you can see from this video, they are very different sort of devices. And knowing the differences is really important. Again, I'm going to say for the last time, both of these implants are great. Uh, please don't kill me for saying something, my opinion. Uh, I hope that um, I've been as unbiased as I can be because I think they're both really good implants. I'll stop saying the same thing over and over again. Take care. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.